Uh, good evening, everybody. We're into uh, the evening session of day two at the Producers Conference. Welcome to you. And um, we have set this meeting up this evening as a Q&A, which means that your mics can be unmuted at any point in time. Uh, the way I like to run this is just the way I run a meeting when we're face to face, and that is I want to be interrupted. I don't want to go on if we are on different pages. If we only get halfway through what I'm going to say or think I'm going to say, but we're all together at the end of the time that we want to do this, that's the point. I want to make sure that any questions, concerns, or other things that I can address, I, I get a chance to do it. And that's going to mean you've got to step up to the plate and turn that mic on or, uh, yeah, turn that microphone on or get down there in that chat. I've got the chime turned on so that when you post a, a question or a comment, um, it'll alert me to it. Even though I'm preoccupied listening to my own mouth, I'll look over there and, and we'll, we'll take a break and see what's going on. Uh, Mary, how are we going to play that slide set now? Right there, right? All I got to do is uh, figure out where it is. This is the video? No. Um, I guess oh, it must shot. be. Yeah, share slides. Right here. Okay. All right. Welcome, Larry. Welcome, Earl. Welcome, David. Hi, Suzanne. Welcome back. <laughs> and how are you, Dave? <laughs> While this thing's loading, turn your mics on. How did you like today's uh, main presentations, morning and afternoon? How did we do with uh, Dr. Kruger's um, uh uh, triple triple header trying to deal with her content. <laughs> we are now recording. Um, no comments. Actually, Jim, trying talking. to present somebody else's talk might be the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't think of any two people I would rather have tag teamed with than with that with that pair I had with me today. <laughs> but I got an awful lot out of that. I, you know, it's, um, it was a really good exercise. I hope everybody else got half as much out of that as I did, because when you've got to try to present it, you really got to dig for what's the content. <laughs> and it was a lot easier digging with you and Frank than it would have been by myself. <laughs> well, we're celebrating the conclusion of the year of, what is it called? The year of soil or something like that, Mary? Is that what we call yes, it? the year of the soil. The year of the soil. The international yeah. year of the soil. Yes, right. The international year of the soil. And uh, so we're going to pay attention to it. We're going to do a post-mortem on it. Post-mortem on it. This was uh, a visual I found that is in, it was created sort of in, in recognition of this and it's so busy that there's absolutely no way I'm going to talk about virtually anything that's on there. But it does actually provide a platform for reviewing the connectedness of what we've been talking about ever since the bell, the first bell went off. And that it all connects with human nutrition, mineralization of plant tissues, um, the microbiomes, how it's all connected together. This actually tries in its own way to uh, embrace um, the connectedness that um, has begun to really rise in our consciousness and realizing that we do well with soil, we do well with our own soil or our own selves. Um, uh, this, is, this is something that I wanted to play. I hope it's live. We'll see because it really strikes at the part of what we're about. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. 
So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. So God made a farmer. I need somebody with arms strong enough to wrestle a calf and yet gentle enough to deliver his own grandchild. Somebody to call hogs, tame cantankerous machinery, come home hungry, have to wait lunch until his wife's done feeding visiting ladies, then tell the ladies to be sure and come back real soon and mean it. So God made a farmer. God said I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn colt and watch it die and dry his eyes and say maybe next year. I need somebody who can shape an axe handle from a persimmon sprout, shoe a horse with a hunk of car tire, who can make harness out of hay wire, feed sacks, and shoe scraps, who planting time and harvest season will finish his 40-hour week by Tuesday noon and then pain in from tractor back, put in another 72 hours. So God made a farmer. God had to have somebody willing to ride the ruts at double speed to get the hay in ahead of the rain clouds and yet stop in midfield and race to help when he sees the first smoke from a neighbor's place. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink combed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. It had to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners. Somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed, and rake, and disc, and plow, and plant, and tie the fleece, and strain the milk, and replenish the self-feeder, and finish a hard week's work with a five-mile drive to church. Somebody who'd bail a family together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing, who would laugh, and then sigh, and then reply with smiling eyes when his son says, that he wants to spend his life doing what dad does. So God made a farmer. And on the eighth. <laughs> okay, how do I get out of this? <laughs> All right. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. There we go. I get rid of enough screens. <clears throat> every time I hear Paul Harvey, every time I hear Paul Harvey do that, I I get teary eyed, choked up. <laughs> but it helps to bring us back to that holistic aspect of what we're all involved in. That uh, Frank Dean weeps in his soul about how that farming has become um, another cog in an industrial complex or an industrial process, and that it's lost its its stewardship aspects to uh, a very great degree, and just become another business. And it it was never in God's heart to make farming just another business. And so I wanted to play that to help us keep being centered as we go through this conversation tonight. I wanted to, for the sake of folks who are largely not here tonight, <laughs> so I will go through this very briefly because I think everyone who's listening tonight has heard this story about the standing water. But I have to repeat it because of my recent visit to Florida, where uh, a man who's probably old enough to retire from federal service in the soil and water um, recounted this story almost verbatim. I was just absolutely spellbound as I heard him recount this story. It happened on February 13th of 83. I had in my possession at that time a 15 foot three point hitch tool known as a groundhog. But it was being painted red was yellow and instead of having groundhog on the frame it said airway and on this early morning after an incredible warming trend in the middle of february you don't see any snowflakes there this is taken in northern new york in the middle of the lake ontario uh, snow belt where it can snow 
a foot in an hour without any problem. There's not a piece of snowflake around. Temperature out there on that day was about 72. And uh, it had been that way for several days. In fact, we're looking at the fifth day that the water had stood on that spot on that hayfield. That's the county road there to the upper part of the slide going past the waterworks for the city of Adams in Jefferson County, New York. My client called me six o'clock in the morning as his wife milked the cows. And he said, how long can I have standing water on my alfalfa before it dies? And I said, well, five days is probably about it. The oxygen is depleted and probably the pathogens are taking over. He said, well, that gives you basically about 24 hours to figure out how to get this water off of this alfalfa field for me. And I said, well, I can come help carry gas and drag hoses as we suck it off and blow it in your creek on the other side of the field. He said, well, yeah, that's nice, but I got another idea. I said to him, okay, what is it? And he asked me if I still had that ignorant looking thing that just went around poking holes in the ground that I dragged around county. And I said, yes, I do. In fact, it's down the road a couple of miles. I'm going there this afternoon to uh, hook it behind his 7520 and his corn planter behind that to see if how it behaves together. When you guys get done wasting all that time, he said, you come on up here because I think if we drive through those water holes with that machine, I can drain them. And I, you know what my, my response was, if you've heard me tell the story. I told him he was crazy. And, of course, he suggested that this was my opportunity to prove it. And so at around 3 o'clock that afternoon, and I launched off down the side of that field next to the county road. And uh, you can see where water used to sit on the edge of that hole. There goes Donnie. You can read the story, I think, on our website. It was at about this time when the county extension agronomist came into the dooryard where I was taking pictures, asked what we thought we were doing. And I said, well, we're watching air bubbles come up out of the water. And as you can see, the water is disappearing. Or his next question was, well, what about the wheel tracks? And I said, who cares? <laughs> the water is disappearing. If we lose a wheel track, it's no big deal. And so we planted this flag. We thought maybe we could just observe how fast it disappeared, calculate some kind of disappearance rate, but <laughs> that wasn't practical. This is, a rather, this is a rather poor slide made from a two by two uh, transparency, two by two slide with a 35 millimeter. This picture was actually taken by the extension agent seven o'clock the next morning. It was still pretty dark when he drove by. But he said, I want you to have this picture because I drove back to that field at seven o'clock that night of the day that you did it, that you ran through these fields or this field. He said, and this is what it looked like 12 hours before I actually took this picture. I said, oh, <laughs> he said he drove all around with his Chevy pickup truck and never spun a wheel. The field was literally dried out. This is that red flag sitting there in that, in that slide and the first cutting hay. You couldn't find any sign of a wheel track or any evidence that there had ever been serious standing water on the field. What this did was provoke me to do something in terms of following up on this experience that has basically opened up my understanding. And I've shared this with several of you, probably everyone on this call. And there may be an exception, but uh, essentially we know that soils that are in good condition as far as air spaces and voids and lacks of restrictions and so forth, uh, basically transport water downward very efficiently through the soil particles and air, which is here characterized by the yellow arrows is um, is exchanged with the water. As the water moves in, displaces air in the soil, it, it pushes the air out, um, and thereby the soil receives an air change. Um, however, over time, 
what I discovered, and I'll show you the data here in just a minute, what happens is the silt particles, which are nearly the same density as water, actually move with the water as it courses through the macropores, and it transport this, transports the silt particles with itself. And you can see what I've tried to do here is characterize that by that layer that is uh, a series of like three little brown particles that are beginning to coalesce and in effect beginning to occlude the pore spaces or the openings in the macropores. The water begins to slow down at this point and of course air changes become more limited below that zone and the more water transports, the more silt transports, the more water stands on top of that density layer, which is composed of silt particles. All we did that day was essentially poke a hole, fracture effectively, and allow the water and the air to exchange through that layer of accumulated silt. It became more than just a theory when I did a very simple agronomy 101 procedure and it was very simple i took a one inch core from zero to one inches and on down through for seven inches and i put each one in a separate bag i sent them to our friend bob perry and i said bob i want a mechanical assay on every inch i want to know how much sand silt and clay is contained in each inch of the soil and there you see the blue bars representing the sand, the purple bars representing the silt concentration, and the tan bars representing the clay, sand, silt, and clay. That's just the way they would go down in a graduated cylinder in Agronomy 101, and you would measure with your calipers to determine the percentages of the various uh, uh, three particle sizes to classify the soil. Now in the field, we did not do all of the field. We left areas where there was no water untilled. And so we could go back and actually look at this distribution in areas where we had run the tool and we had taken additional rainfall and of course moved the water that was sitting on top up to 12, 14 inches deep down through that soil. And we could see if there was any difference in those mechanical assays for each one of those inches. And in the foreground, you see an untilled area. It was just slightly over two years that uh, it had been untilled. Prior to it, uh, in establishing the alfalfa, we had run a deep tillage tool at approximately 18 to 20 inches. We'd run a Danish tine harrow, no sweeps, no disking in an effort to just establish enough of a seedbed that we could seed the alfalfa, trying to minimize all kinds of mechanical problems that might have affected this, the development of the tap roots. And then the tall green bars represents the area where we ran this um, groundhog machine through the water, through the standing water. And you can see how the curves are very different and how it effectively flushed the silt down out of that fifth inch. Now, I hasten to add <laughs> the amount of silt that was contained there, which produces that somewhat of a spike, was probably indistinguishable from the rest of the soil in that inch. It was a layer that was probably no more than a few thousandths of an inch deep, but it had the effect of plugging the drain, you might say or stopping the movement of water. These mics are all closed. You're all mic, you're all muted. And uh, I wanna pause right there. Just make sure there are no questions or that you understand what the procedures was that I used here. Is everybody okay before I go on? <laughs> okay. All right. And he, <clears throat> of course, one of the reasons why I was I'm very interested in this whole process is because I was in an area where we have a, a huge amounts of snowfall. We get significant rainfall and everybody in our area 
who tried to grow alfalfa to feed dairy cows always had this perennial problem of heaving where the tap roots would be thrust upward and broken off and the plants would die. And it usually happened in the springtime of the third year of life, sometimes the second year. Depended on the soil, depended on a lot of other variables, but in the area generally life expectancy on alfalfa stands was as a really good stand was two to three years. And if you wanted to have some grass out there to keep it viable, then that worked uh, to keep the stand in hay for maybe another year or two before it went back to corn. This work was done and published actually in uh, a book that was uh, edited by uh, Scott Russell uh, called Plant Root Systems. McGraw-Hill published it. And what it shows is the root system distribution of a spring planted crop. I believe in this case it was barley. Yes, spring barley. And what it shows here is that in the month prior to establishment, on one year, it received 82 millimeters of water. In another, in another situation, the next year or whatever, the root system was evaluated when only 24 inches or 24 millimeters of water was uh, received by the field. So you're looking at approximately one inch versus nearly four inches the previous month. And you can see here that the lighter colored bar with a higher amount of rainfall resulted in a large concentration of root masses in the top portion, two and a half to 12.5 centimeters of soil. When the rainfall was more limited the month prior, there was only a little over 40% of the total root mass that was located in that same zone. So something was actually resulting from rainfall was changing the distribution of these root systems under this barley crop. I got a real eye opener when I found this study, which was done in England, where they actually treated a barley root again with ethylene. Remember hearing that word before yesterday with, uh, we talked about it real briefly with Frank Dean. Well, ethylene is a growth regulator, and that's why it's applied to ripen those red tomatoes. What happened in these two experiments is that for a period of time and uh, 35 days, the seedling was 35 days old, this plant was grow grew uninterrupted, unamended, the one on the left, by anything. No ethylene was added. And you can see how this root developed long and straight and with brace roots and all kinds of hair roots on it. The root on the right, same plant, same barley, was subjected to a concentration of ethylene equal to 10 parts per million, which is actually relatively small. But you can see that in the same period of time between the two arrows, what happened to the root development? It no longer elongated the root, but it branched the root. If you take this and you superimpose it on this bar graph, you have your answer. The point of these two slides is, I think, fairly obvious. And that is that any soil which goes anaerobic for any serious amount of time is going to generate a growth regulator called ethylene. And any plant that's growing there that's trying to establish a normal root pattern is going to be adversely influenced. And this is, for me, a real take home when you start to consider that forage crops are essentially a no-till crop after the first year. They have to establish new root masses, otherwise they fail to be perennials. They become annuals and they start to die because they don't get a chance to reestablish a root mass. Played that video from Florida to lead us out tonight because we were in that horse pasture and the root systems underneath those grasses, which included some that should be very deep rooted, were only about two inches deep. That was it. And it's because it's just been constantly plagued with standing water producing ethylene. And in the springtime of the year, 
when this crop in that pasture should be growing new deep root masses, it's experiencing ethylene flushes, which are limiting the depth of the root that's being established. So, Purdue, of all people, did this study. I'm guessing I found this slide, it was probably in the mid 80s. And they compared root system distribution in the top three, next three, next three, next three, down to 12 inches. They measured the milligrams per core of root weights in a plow system, a chisel plow system, and a no-till system. And I've never taken the liberty of adding those numbers up. But if you do, you'll find out that there's really very little difference in terms of the total root mass. But there's a huge difference in terms of distribution. Notice 625 versus 275 and 250 in the top three inches. Next three inches, there's more roots in this conventional ground than there is in the top three. And then they all kind of equalize out by the time you get down in that six to nine inches and below that into what would be normally characterized as plow pan country. So that to me was, you know, the, the, a very affirming, and you see it in real life. Here is here is a long-term no-tiller from Indiana, um, and this is the kind of root mass that 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 farm has been generating. It's got some earthworm holes, and you can see some of the major roots have made it through there. But this looks just to me like that Purdue chart on no-till. Huge amount of root mass in the top three inches. Now, the reason this is really significant, of course, is because root systems have a clock. They grow on a clock, which the creator gave them. And that clock has um, got several different elements in it, but uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those tonight. But suffice it to say that when a root is initiated, it has essentially three days or 72 hours to reach wherever it can go. It tries to go as far as it can go in the time it has. And that phase is called the expansion phase. On an annual that lasts uh, for approximately 40 days. And at that time, the ear embryo forms. And basically, the row count is, is finalized. The decision is made based on what these root systems have done for 40 days in three hour intervals per root. And of course, more than one root is emanating at one time. After that embryo count, after that embryo is formed, we have an establishment phase where basically the plant fills in wherever it can within the boundaries that were set. And at pollination, there is no new root activity, period. So after that July date, whatever it is that pollen grains fall, and you have a plant that's pregnant, the root mass we've got is the root mass we're going to have when we get done. It doesn't get any bigger. Any questions? Here was a root system that was shared with us uh, as Brookside Consultants by a guy named Al Trass. He came to talk to us in the 7980 period at one of the annual meetings. This was a pioneer variety that was grown in zero compacted soil in a growth chamber at the National Tillage Laboratory at Auburn University. And the equivalent yield on this plant that they calculated was around 400 bushels. And there was no fertility added. The only rainfall we got was what fell outside in the actual laboratory itself. So this is the kind of thing that can happen if we could learn how to eliminate these physical barriers and the reality of it is my experience is that the biggest single thing that we can do to eliminate those barriers is to begin to grow root masses like these and you actually can do it i know you can one of our problems is that this type of technology has been um, misrepresented, let's put it that way, since 1988. And as a result of that uh, 
change in the part which really matters about this technology, no one has seen essentially any benefits. Um, the problem is that the time change in engineering, which took place in that year, essentially rendered the machine a sheep's foot packer. And it did it because the design of the tine increased the speed of that shaft you saw in that video. And as a result, it didn't fracture soil anymore. It merely went round and round and poked holes. And the hole that it creates, it looks like this. It um, is nicely compacted on one side and smeared. And um, some soil is usually plucked up out of the hole. It's what Airway has been selling as their shatter time ever since 1988. It now is property of Salford, uh, the people from Salford, Ontario, Canada, who make the RTS and a number of other tillage tools of every size. And um, the particular interest in this, evacu in this hole was that, in fact, this was done right here in Indiana is that the vertical face to the left of that hole is almost totally vertically straight up. And that hole at the surface is about eight inches in length. The proper original New Zealand technology in that same soil running at the same speed would leave an insertion slot of 12 to 13 inches in length. And the hole would be shaped very differently. And the impact that it would make would be such that you would grow root systems like this. And um, I think I'm going to skip this video tonight. It's on that link. You can see this as a, as a way of actually determining how effective this time has been at creating compaction relief and promoting rooting activity deep in the soil profile. This, uh, this shank looks real familiar, I imagine, Dave Chance. <laughs> And um, you can see right where the bottom of the tine has been running on this technology on this farm for about 10 years. And um, the shank wear is, is almost nothing at that point where the tip of the tine works. And that's because that tine tip is actually dragging in the bottom of the insertion hole, creating the same effect that you get out of this ripper point on this John Deere shank. No more questions or any questions yet? Comments? Okay. This is the kind of characteristic that the tillage creates when the tine is rendered correctly. That, uh, that link uh, to that video that I decided to pass by tonight is on YouTube. It's got about 10,000 hits. I don't know why it's got so many, but in some respects, it, it's really worth looking at because it actually shows you the root systems that have developed in video uh, from the operation of the shatter time and this time. The time entry here enters without leaving any residual compaction force. It exits without lifting soil or lifting root systems out. It creates lateral stresses on both sides of the hole on the curse buster. The vertical stress lines are under the tine tip and water and root systems go through the bottom of the tine penetration as if it had never been there. And it's all produced because of the design of the original Bannon tine from New Zealand that effectively reduces the shaft speed so that all the tines are dragging through the soil as the shaft turns. The result is, of course, water infiltration at the surface is very rapid and uninterrupted. It accelerates percolation through the pile layer, purging air rapidly and restoring air as the water traverses down into the water table. And that, of course, in effect, produces very efficient as well as very frequent soil air exchange. And you get root elongation underneath this plant on that 72-hour clock without much of any interference. This is what you can find out of using conventional tools. Um, Rodney was with us today. Appreciate him allowing me to work with him on this soil. 
But this is a soil which has been organically farmed at the time of this picture in probably 2006 or 2007. Um, and you can see that the soil is totally collapsed. The root systems get through one layer of this and they pancake and then they get down, some of them get down to another layer and then they all start to grow horizontally. And this is a corn root. Um, on organic soils been just tilled, basically tilled to death. Uh, one of the things that um, I want to emphasize that you can start to really see happening, and some of you are on the call tonight, um, are experiencing this in the use of cover crops and crop rotations. And uh, I think we've referred to this briefly perhaps yesterday in some of the conversations. In fact, I know we did. We talked about the amino acid shift that takes place in the soil nitrogen extract when you have a crop rotation. You can see the green bars and the red bars and how that they've changed their difference in lengths. The red bar represents a corn, oats, clover, three-year sequence of rotation. And the green bars represent a continuous corn, three years of corn. And so some of the green bars extend under the influence of continual grass reduction. And in some cases, they are shorter in comparison to the reds. So whatever goes on there in the rhizosphere in the microbiome that surrounds these different plant species results in this shift of these amino acid concentrations. And to me, that's always represented food source changes for other colonizing fungi and bacteria that are going to be more drawn to another species of plant. And, uh, and one dairy farmer one day actually told me this kind of thing that any product that would create this in soil ought to be called colostrum because it's as good as mother's first milk when you can create an environment here which uh, essentially mimics the concentrations that you find behind any legume in a rotation. And a lot of farmers are not growing much in the way of rotations. The only, the only legume in the farm may be one year of beans. Any other, any questions, anybody? Anybody who stop me? All right. And of course, some of you who hung out with me for any length of time know that this is my ultimate dream that everyone would grow continuously green, 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 a perennial and an annual together. Now, this doesn't look very promising. And um, in fact, it, it didn't turn out very well. And there's a reason for it. And you can see that right next to it, the same exact field, it looked very different. And the only difference was, frankly, tillage. In the fall, before this was harvested for hay, in the next year, in the spring, there was one pass made with uh, the product we call the Gentil. Same times as what we went through that standing water with. Then after the corn was about four inches, five inches tall, we made another pass. This corn on this side of the field, which is into the right of this picture, never got any tillage. He cut the hay just like he did the rest of the field, and he just no-tilled that corn in. And that's what you had. It wound up with very spindly stalks. It wound up that he couldn't even combine it because it lodged so badly. But the goal was to actually measure the yield difference, but he couldn't do it because he couldn't harvest it. The other side of this field stood like phone poles and had a tremendous crop. There's your amino acids shift taking place right while you're growing corn. And I think we may have mentioned this yesterday, I'm not sure, but one of the reasons why this, this can work is because the alfalfa has existed there long enough that it's actually released nodule nitrogen from decaying and dead root masses, some of which have probably been eaten off, others which have just become dysfunctional because they've plugged up with extraneous uh, minerals that have uh, caused them to die and to uh, just give up and hopefully they've been replaced 
And if, in fact, the soil has been tilled routinely on a regular basis so that the soil is managing air and water and densities are reduced so that the plant can produce new root masses, this alfalfa will reroot on a regular basis based on how it's managed. One of the most exciting parts about, in my opinion, of having a living mulch strategy in place is the fact that it calls back foraging insects. Uh, as I have said other places, I think, in the program, insects, foraging insects, are, in my, in my mind, unsung heroes. And they're unsung heroes mostly because we don't ever see them going to work. And mostly because we don't ever give them anything to do. Or we don't give them any place to live or to raise their young people or have any kind of a habitat that allows them to recolonize, repopulate our fields. They hang out in the hedgerows, in the woods, every place where we don't do anything, that's where they are. In this particular case, I had an individual who grew this alfalfa corn thing together. And um, he also had some fields where he didn't do any tillage, but it was a grass cover that all died, was killed uh, chemically. And another field that actually was uh, disc two years before and maintained as a more or less clean till environment. And I was challenged in October during harvest as to whether or not I'd observe the difference in the amount of 12 month old corn stalks that were on these various fields. Uh, the, the client's concern was, how am I going to seed alfalfa into some of these fields? I got so many corn stalks. I don't know if I can get my alfalfa seed to the ground. And um, I had to admit, I hadn't really been paying much attention. I'd just been going around and getting my soil samples and trying to follow my maps and be sure I got it right. And so under his prodding, I went back and I started investigating these harvested cornfields. And you know, he was right. That was a huge difference. So I gathered some feed bags up and I went and I measured a thousandth of an acre in several places in each field. And what I did was air dry then and weigh these bags to determine how much dried corn stover that was 12 months old was actually still on the surface of these fields. And you can see there's quite a significant difference, not just in amount, but also in the very character the nature of the residue itself. The one on the right is 2,000 pounds, the one in the middle 5,000 pounds, and the one on the left 3,000 pounds. And if we had more time and the luxury of it and uh, hadn't been such a long day, I'd probably give a quiz. I'm notorious for doing that when it comes to this slide. But instead, I'll just tell you plainly, the clean till environment that had used a heavy offset disc to uh, work up the sod the first year, the first year residue that remained was 5,000 pounds. The one that was the grass, the grass field that was contact killed, there was no regrowth, it looked like clean till by the fall, it actually had 3,000 pounds of 12 month old material still sitting on the surface at harvest a year after, you know, one year old. And uh, you've already guessed the 2,000 pound was what was gathered up on a field that grew alfalfa uh, and lots of it. It was so thick, in fact, you couldn't walk through it. And it had grown up in some cornfield with four regrowths during the season. The corn yielded virtually the same on all of these fields. And not only had the alfalfa all disappeared, there was none of that available, but they had also obviously eaten a lot of the corn residue. I sort of characterize it as uh, kids who come home from school and they want an ice cream sandwich, you know, and um, all the foraging insects that were out there growing and raising families, you know, the kids would come home from school and say, hey, mom, can we have some more ice cream, you know? And she'd say, oh, yeah, there, you know, there's, there's, help yourselves, you know, lots of alfalfa. And so they'd eat this very high quality, high protein, highly digestible, high energy, low lignin, broadleaf fiber. And gee, they had more family, more family. They ate more. They had more ice cream sandwiches. And then one day they all came home 
from school and they said, hey, mom, where's the ice cream sandwiches? And she said, well, you've eaten them all. The alfalfa has gone, kids. You're going to have to eat celery. And so they started working on corn stalks. And they ate a lot of them. About 3,000 pounds per acre of corn stalks had disappeared compared to areas where there had been no ice cream sandwiches. There was nothing to actually support the continuing growth of those foraging insect populations. And so there was nobody there to eat celery. To me, this is the basis. In fact, on this very farm, Bob Perry called me when he saw the soil test results from the three inch cores that I was taking on this farm. At the conclusion of three to four years of running that tillage tool, parking the disc and doing a lot of this residue, dairy manure, surface applying everything, Bob called me up and he said, are you using something like paper waste or something and spreading it on these on this farm? I said, no, Bob, why? He said, well, this is a high line farm and your pHs are always around seven or better. And I said, yeah, we, we struggle with it. He said, well, you got organic matters here that are equal to or greater than the pH. We've we've rechecked and make sure we didn't enter the data wrong. This farm has been a 4% organic matter, but not seven. What are you doing? And that was um, that was Bob's introduction to how this tillage system affected organic matter in that initially in that top three inches or so. And of course, start you start high, but it keeps working down. And these are the kinds of critters that I want on your farm. You want them on your farm because these are the recyclers of those cover crops. These are the recyclers of your main crops. And these guys are filled with all these digestive enzymes and bacteria and all kinds of things that turn that useless lignin and fibrous material into real microbial food. Um, I won't take total exception to people being really excited about seeing um, actinomyces growing on corn stalks and, and things like that. But I think that it's relatively small potatoes compared to what these guys can do. The chewing insects are powerful recyclers. The day that a fungus or a bacteria comes equipped with the kind of chewing devices and the teeth that these beetles, lace wings, microarthropods, um, these critters, these foragers have, we'll have some kind of recycling going on. But the fact is, they don't have teeth. And chewing up lignin is a job for teeth. So all these guys need to proliferate is good food and shelter. And they will flock to your farm. And they will put everything up. Uh, the Lord willing, and I live to do this again, you're going to hear from Jonathan Lundgren. And I would commend you to looking for his videos on YouTube. Jonathan is uh, no longer in government service. <laughs> He's joined the ranks of one Mary Lucero. <laughs> <laughs> and Jonathan um, is starting his own research farm by the grace of God. Uh, you will just love listening to him. He is absolutely passionate about these thousands of species of insects and how good they are for the ecos the agro ecosystem. This is what this particular alfalfa field in northern New York looked like the next year. And you can see the corn stalks that went into the spring. And uh, there was only 2,000 pounds of those left per acre by the end of the summer. And so this is the recovery, the very typical recovery of keeping that plant alive through the first year of corn. Uh, in my 
in my humble opinion, I have anyone yet to really strike into those. Um, I wouldn't plant corn here a second time. I would come into this and I would just harvest it for hay for maybe two years. And I'd plant corn again. I would not try to do more than one or two years, probably just one year of corn. Remember, this is a broadleaf plant here, this alfalfa, the clovers, same way. A broadleaf because they're very sensitive. Uh, to the amount of sunlight they have to have in order to feed the nodules and the sugars and sucrose that they need. So when you put this plant into a severe shade environment in um, a normal population of corn, there's a lot of shade, this plant really suffers in its ability to produce sugars. So it needs a break from the shade. And so therefore I say, Probably one year of corn is all you ought to do at a time. Can I discuss how you go about harvesting the corn and alfalfa in a mixed planting? Um, corn for grain, Mary, or corn for silage, or does I, I can discuss both. It's a it's a real whoops it's a real slam dunk for the people that grow whoops <laughs> wrong button. It's a real slam dunk for the people that grow corn silage to feed dairy or beef cattle uh, because most of the newer choppers, harvesters, are running what's called a Kemper style header, um, which harvests everything. It literally cuts everything that's standing in the field. Um, People who've done that have seen increases in protein in the corn silage because of the presence of alfalfa, up in the 11, 11 and a half percent protein instead of an eight to nine percent. Not a lot unless you realize you're eating 60 to 70 pounds a day of this and it can constitute up to 50% of the dairy ration. So it gets very significant. You have done very little really to hurt the alfalfa, it'll have time with a normal silage harvest to regrow and get some extra sunlight on some new regrowth in the fall. Harvesting corn for grain with a regular combine is just a walk in the park. Uh, you don't need weed control chemicals out here because the alfalfa has everything totally shaded and under control. And if you've been doing the form of tillage that we're talking about here tonight, you won't have any weeds in that alfalfa stand after years and years of productivity because you'll be actually cultivating out those weeds every time you run the tool. So I don't know if that answers the question adequately, Mary, but I will be happy to take a follow-up question any, any way you want to deliver it to me. No, actually, that's kind of good. I Almost any time I talk about mixed plantings, I get questions about harvest and um, mm -hmm. ba basically just the, the mainstream thought that it's totally um, impractical because there's no way to harvest this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, when you, I have a slide somewhere in the stacks of what this looked like before the harvest and you didn't want to walk through it because you'd probably get tangled up and fall down. The first cutting of alfalfa was way over my belt. The second was close to that. The third was up to the bottom of my zipper. Fourth cutting was knee high and it was all snarled in together through a course of three and a half months of growth, uninterrupted growth. Now no how's your chemical. cycle working? Where, where is the corn when you're taking your first, second and third alfalfa harvest? How well, is we're, we're leaving all of that in the field that all of that growth is staying right there in the field. The, the plant, when it gets to about 30 days of age, of course, initiates a new plant from the crown. The buds are initiated there into new vegetative growth. The first, first growth is blooming and flowering and honeybees are in there gathering nectar and pollinating. And the second growth is coming up out of the bottom. Then that one flowers and the honeybees are back again and you get this, this cycle of all of these honeybees. Uh, it's absolutely, a, it's, it's mayhem out there. In fact, we did a video and if the camera guy got more than four rows away from me, the sound of the honeybees was so strong that we had to raise our voices 
in order to feel like we could be heard. You know how you do that instinctively in a noisy environment. You, you keep raising your voice. We had to do that if we were just four rows of corn apart. That's how many honeybees were in there. And they didn't even care if we were there. They were just totally snowed under with, with uh, gathering nectar from all these alfalfa flowers. Uh, maybe I didn't make that clear, but the alfalfa just grows uninterruptedly. We don't go in there to harvest it. We don't do anything with it. Just let the honeybees okay. have it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I think is a really great deal for this is that you turn the cows in this after corn grain harvest. Just let them graze. It's fantastic. You got a be beautiful ration here with alfalfa and corn stalks. You got everything you need. The protein's all there. The energy's there. And they're going to do a great job of manuring this whole field and getting everything cleaned right off, ready for whatever alfalfa you want to harvest there next year, you know, however you want to deal with the field. Um, this is where I'd like to see some of these partnerships between cattle people, whether they're beef cattle or dairy cattle, whatever they are, you know, you need to be working with row crop people who don't have cattle and let's truck them in there and put up temporary fences or whatever it takes. And let's, let's get some animal waste on this field to go along with the bug waste you know, from the insects that are eating out there. Let's tag team these mm -hmm. enterprises together. Not everybody's got to have cows, but everybody ought to have the benefits cows. Um, there's several, there's several dynamics to this, um, which some of our folks listening to me tonight have heard before. Uh, one is, and I'm not, I didn't bring, into this all the slides. I don't think I've got much of anything more on this, but the water transpiration rates on these two different plants, corn and alfalfa, are such that the corn is literally benefiting from the moisture that is transpired from the alfalfa. Alfalfa transpires approximately 835 pounds of water per pound of dry matter produced in normal sunlight and corn requires 273 pounds of water for a pound of dry matter produced. The difference there is about 250%. Iowa State says that corn has the capacity to take up to 80% of its total water requirement from the atmosphere which is exactly where alfalfa is going to put that 850 some pounds of, of water. Combine that with the fact that every 12 hours, both of these plants are changing gears from giving off CO2 to giving off oxygen. The more CO2 the corn has, the better it does. So we now have a CO2 pump that's operating 12 hours a day in the understory, producing a huge amount of CO2. And this is one reason why I frankly rarely ever seen this system fail in drought. It's not just the fact that there's water being transpired. It's the fact that also the understory living mulch is giving up CO2. For the most part, a lot of drought stress in corn crops is because soil temperatures soar so high that the normal CO2 production of the microbial the soil microbial world is throttled down so low that there is basically a starvation for CO2 for the corn. It's producing oxygen and it cannot get it changed. And then and twin row corn and narrow row corn is even more notorious for suffering from a lack of air change. So this system actually produces air change right in the field, on the job, every day. Of course, combine this now with the fact that a soil which structurally is operating optimally, and you're going to have a water table which is rising and falling, predictably with the passage of the moon and the sun around the planet, and it will 
literally rise to push out CO2 into the crop canopy and fall, push back in high oxygen soils and high nitrogen, excuse me, high carbon dioxide, excuse me, high oxygen and nitrogen content to fuel up the soil microbiome. We've, we've, we've recognized for years that 80% of what this crop is going to produce is going to come out of the air. It's not going to come out of the 5% of soil amendments or the mineral or the ash that's in that plant. 80 to plus 85 to 90% is actually a product of things that are contained in the air. So when the soil system fails to breathe through passage of uh, the moon or creating gravity, uh, gravitational pull on the water table and causing uh, respiration of the soil, between that and the plants respiring, breathing, this system becomes dynamic. And um, it essentially begins to restore the full productive potential because all of a sudden the microbiome is actually breathing on a regular basis. That's one of the reasons why I, I say this over here at some point. The regenerative soil, it's one which is quote unquote tilled to restore air and water exchange potential on a regular basis without destroying the delicate balance of soil and plant microbiomes. It number two promotes extensive root development, thereby depositing lots of carbon in the form of roots, which are readily degradable, readily digested and available as food sources and provides shelter, food for beneficial insects. We want them to return and we want them to populate in large numbers, not just to eat our stuff, our leftovers, but we also want them to be there to discourage pathogenic insects, predatories, you know, let's get these natural predators back. And then Jonathan talks a lot about this. Very exciting. And then, of course, uh, we need a soil system that's regenerative because it is accelerating aerobic, microbial, and beneficial fungal reproduction through regular daily soil respiration. Mary, you said it today, I think earlier, about how you realized that oxidation, aeration, um, going for that walk, that brisk walk, and the fact that, well, tonight after supper, I went downstairs and I split some wood because it was time to do some deeper breathing. It felt really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt much more for what we're doing tonight because I, I spent 15 or 20 minutes uh, splitting some firewood. This is the kind of thing that develops. Uh, Todd Mason, uh, we, we have a video. Uh, you, can, you can purchase that video on our website, uh, soilcursebuster.com. Um, it was made from a field day. Um, and this is the kind of plants he grows. It doesn't look like that stuff we saw in those slides of Bob's today, <laughs> and not even remotely. In fact, in the video, which was shot on the 27th of September, the corn silage had been removed for over a month. In the background, you saw this corn. In, this, in fact, it was the same field, but it was several years after when we had the field day. Here's this corn standing, 27th of September. It looks just like this, except that the ears are all this brown and the husks are all opened up and it's ready for a combine at about 22 to 24% moisture grain in Northern New York. And there's not a brown leaf on the corn. It is green all the way to the ground and all the way to the tassel. The plant is sitting there like, we're just, fat and sassy, and this feels really good. We like sunshine and rain and whatever. And the fruit we've produced is jam-packed full of goodies. And it's ready for the harvest. And the plant you could have chopped and put in the silo. It was so green and so lush. This is the kind of root system that Todd creates on that farm. In 1999, they went for 92 days from the 10th of June to the 12th of September without one drop of precipitation. 
and they suffered a reduction of 17% from their farm average corn silage yield, which is 24 tons. And the 24 ton mark is approximately two tons shy of twice the county average. And that's what they've maintained since about 1985, 86, when they broke into this system. Suzanne has a question. And we have another question. Can you discuss how you go about harvest? Oh, that's yours before. Okay. Uh, paired planting symbiosis seems like a great subject for a book. <laughs> I've never seen a book on it, Suzanne, but that's not to say that somebody may not have written about it. Unfortunately, most of the, the works that I've ever found about the subject um, People are trying to establish the living mulch in the corn crop after the corn crop has been planted, not trying to address establishing the corn crop in an established living mulch. And so they have weed issues, they have herbicides that are necessary to control weeds early, or they have to use cultivators and then you have this young plant that's trying to establish itself in the shade of the corn, which is a really stacked deck for a broadleaf plant to try to make a, make a fetch of growing up in the dark. It just it doesn't work well. So most of that has never come to much of anything. Um, I don't know of any books that really go into this. I don't. It's just one more thing I have to do, I see. Now, let's see. Let's talk about the soil health thing a little bit. And Mary, you're very welcome to comment here because if you know some more about this Haney test than I do, the reason I chose the Haney test is because graphically Jim Porterfield had helped me create these. And it, it shows some cumulative history differences between what Doug Young has done on his farm over the years using conventional tillage ripping and disking and soil finishing and basically the same rotation as the dairy farm that the masons have in northern new york but a very different approach in terms of tillage basically same number of cows per acre same amount of manure it's kind of a carbon copy the young farm identified here on the left is uh, probably as good a soil as you'll find anywhere in the country it's a silt loam known as a honey oil, and it is the desire of every New York dairyman, crop producer, cabbage grower, snap bean grower to have a honey oil silt loam. It's great stuff. Now, the Mason farm is, I can't tell you the soil association because, frankly, everyone has forgotten it. Most everyone has forgotten about making a living on it, too, except maybe as a hunting preserve or growing mulch hay for feeding mushroom growers. But this farm um, is extremely viable. We built a new barn and put a couple of robotic milter, milters in it a couple of years ago. <laughs> That's how successful they are. This, um, so I'm gonna show you a series of these graphs that uh, depict certain elements of the Haney test. And you can see basically what the impact of tillage has been in several categories. This is water extracted total organic carbon, 116 versus 249. Most of these are pretty self-explanatory. This is um, organic carbon, the organic N, carbon nitrogen ratio. The graphs are terribly different in height, but um, uh, really, that's not, I mean, it's only 17%. It still is significant. The closer you get to 10 to 1, the better off you are. Now, this is that CO2 burst of the Solvita test, where you get some more indirect measurement on um, the biology that's there and how it's evolving CO2 when you wet it. Did you, Mary, would you be interested in commenting on the Solvia at all any further? 
So quite frankly, I learned about Solvita this fall when, when you started sending me some of these test results and I thought, oh, what is this? I better look it up. All right. <laughs> that said, I, uh, I did spend some time on their website and even called and visited with them a little while. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, it, it reminds me a lot of, of uh, community level physiological profiling. It's a technique we use for for looking at changes in, in diverse microbial populations, except mm -hmm. that this has compacted it all down. So all they're really looking at is uh, respiration. You might say, is the soil breathing with this? Mm -hmm. Is there respiration occurring? And uh, of course you would expect the respiration to increase as the microbial population increases. So the advantages are that it's a nice, quick, relatively cheap, easy assay to run. The mm -hmm. downside to it is it's not going to tell you a lot about the diversity of the microbial community that is creating that respiration. So for example, in a compost, you could have a totally bacterial compost, no, no food web hierarchy in there. And it could give you in theory a great Ovida respiration rate, but all you've got in there uh, is bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it doesn't tell you much about the structure of the community. It's just more about that there's a lot of stuff there that's alive, which, which in itself is good information. It's yeah, it definitely shows a difference here between these two soils and the way they've been managed. The results of it are fairly significant. And, yes. and it gets to it gets a little more significant when you see some more of the things. This test here, other than the fact that it's a nitrate nitrogen test, I don't know what H3A even means. I, I need to study it more fully. And if anybody online, and yourself included, Mary, knows how this would vary from any other nitrate nitrogen test, please feel free to jump in here. Right, uh, right now, no. Okay. Again, you know, the levels are fairly modest. Um, and I don't know that you would say that it's really significant that this uh, other soil of the Masons has got anything significant to offer here in terms of its nitrate content. Um, traditional and saving. Now, this is kind of where the Haney test begins to try to make some hay in terms of convincing you as the person who had this test done that uh, it's worth the money. So essentially they're saying that on using a traditional way of calculating nitrogen savings, the Haney would say, you know, you're going to need less. Um, or the traditional, the division, I'm sorry, the traditional would say that there's only this much difference in these two soils. Using the Haney, they're claiming that with their test, this is the kind of level of value of the nitrogen and the biological system that they're finding in their in that soil. And if in fact this is true, then this soil management strategy has netted them approximately $60 of fertilizer input savings to grow the same crop. Based on what the Masons do, I got to say, this is probably not far off. They grow very routinely the equivalent of 180 to 200 bushel corn on 120 units of applied nitrogen all from manure. And that's it. Virtually nothing else goes out there. And so this may not be far off in terms of the practical long-term 30-year records of how they grow that corn silage. Okay, um, differences, Haney test versus traditional. Again, the Haney test is, is rating this Mason farm soil significantly um, healthier, more productive, and I, I would say that when you see the resiliency from lack of rainfall or excessive rainfall, and you see the responsiveness to 
good soil growing, good growing conditions, a good a good season with regular rainfall and good bright sunny skies. This farm did 30 ton silage uh, in 2014. So as a non-irrigated corn crop, that will stack up against almost anybody. In fact, in Golden Harvest Trial, it finished third in the country. Soil health score, relatively modest numbers when they put all of the different things together in the Haney equation to give it give the soil the score, but it's 52 percent. Um, so looking at all you know just those ones those those elements so far you can see that there's definitely been a change in the soil and we've done the pflas on it and i did not want to spend the time getting into all of those parameters but they are very similar and if you have an enduring interest in looking at uh, typical pfla information um, i will be happy to forward it to you so you can look at it We've got a consortium that's working in New York, doing a long-term commitment to continue monitoring soil health advances on the Young Farm and continuing to monitor the Mason Farm. Uh, the Young Farm is moving into the form of soil management through tillage that the Masons have been practicing since 1984. And they're optimistic that they're going to see their soils evolve into what we see on scores here for the masons that's their goal i believe that god has a real blessing in in in, in stored up in his earth uh, the psalmist wrote the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof and i believe under the inspiration of the holy spirit he had a vision for an incredible abundance coming forth when he used the word translated into english as fullness the interesting part is that we know that there is a curse that operates. And it's in my email address. It's, it's called Curse of the Day. And we know that as long as it rains or we put irrigation water out on the top of our fields, we're going to see that curse operating. It's, it's the anatomy of it, we've already discussed. It's the movement of silt, the occlusion of macropores that stop the air and water exchange in the plow layer. And as a result, we lose soil, we lose water, we lose biology, and the whole thing begins to fall apart. And we have to address that curse. Uh, Dave Chance is with us, and I, I blue skied in with him when uh, a few months ago talking about, well, maybe, you know, the soils will evolve to the point where maybe they won't need to have any tillage. Maybe they could be no till. And Dave kind of caught me. He said, no, Jim, it's physics. And God's laws are sure. He commanded us to till the ground because we needed to till the ground, period. The case is settled. And so I, I've thought about that a lot of times, Dave, and I think you're probably right. You know, yeah, it'll, it, it means we sell tines for our machines, but that's really not the point. The point is that we bring forth this blessing and that we're really witnesses of God's goodness to us. We really believe that and we've seen this happen. Uh, pathogens in these environments, we've talked about it. Uh, you know, these pathogens, they succumb under the pressure of beneficial insects. Um, pests literally leave the field. Uh, we talked about it at last year's conference with Brian Lehman there seated with us about watching Western rootworm beetles after four days of looking at those corn silks and going, oh boy, oh boy, those corn silks, they look so good, but there's just something about them. I don't think we want to touch them. And they left after four days. I never saw a, <laughs> a horde of Western beetles ever leave a corn silk alone, ever. And they did. They just totally left the field. We've, uh, in fact, the first experience I had of that was on that cornfield with the alfalfa, those series, that short series of pictures I showed. The field across the, the stone fence that had been dissed had first and second generation corn border damage in the second year of corn. And it was the first year of corn on the wet, on the east side that was getting all the moths flying over 
potentially into that cornfield where the alfalfa was. And I tore that field apart, trying to find one hole anywhere in a, from a second generation border. And there was nothing there. The neighbor, just a quarter mile on the other side of that field, was devastated with corn borer damage, second generation. Why didn't they stop in the first cornfield? It's a logical question. And I haven't had any entomologists yet tell me that what I think happened, happened. But I think if you've got a lot of honeybee activity, <laughs> I don't think you're going to see a lot of butterflies. <laughs> I don't think those two critters get along well at all. And this place was just a buzz of honeybees. And it should have been a buzz with butterflies. But they didn't mix. At any rate. With those insects, you're going to form humus very quickly. You're going to start to produce all these wonderful, magical, organic compounds. The topsoil is literally going to be created faster than it can be washed away. Streams that are formed from water running from these farms is going to be clean. And you're going to start to produce natural fertility released from the parent material that is 2 million pounds of good stuff waiting for God's microbial world to take it apart and turn it into great stuff to eat. You know, we've talked a lot of negative stuff. I wish we had this, this room full tonight because I want to say I'm not negative. I want to take an accurate assessment of where we're at. There's no question about it. I think we've got, I think we've been well assessed. We can see we've got serious issues. But I believe that the goodness that God's put in the earth will far out distance the things that we've done to damage it. We need a little obedience. We got to, you know, we can't grow fingernails if we keep chewing them off kind of thing, right? And I just wanted to leave this greeting from everyone in China. Uh, that my family and the gal in the center of the pigtail is a, a new sister in Christ that we met. And um, she's from Habarovsk, Russia. And Julia works with English speakers as a translator. And um, I'm sure she sends her greetings as well. Ethan and Nina on each end. And um, there are three children. And then my daughter, Heather, my wife, Sandy, and Daniel in the center. They all send their blessings. I've got several comments and questions over here. What do we got? Um, can you discuss how you go about it? We did that one. The pear planting is going to be okay. Um, is Joel Salatin, okay. No tilling. Soil literally cannot be compacted. Yes, that is correct. Constant vibrant health is maintained, but they are very small producers. Yeah, I think, Suzanne, that what I'm proposing is, of course, amenable to small scale and large scale alike. And Dave Chance is getting a taste of that, I believe. Um, I think he can do even more with the technology. He knows I think that. So <laughs> this is not a private pitch or a public pitch, whatever. Um, we've actually, you know, Dave is doing the fundamental as is... Um, Rodney Graham has a tool. Uh, Earl Canfield has a tool. Many of these people that are with us here tonight are doing the basics that are required. Andy's got a vertical tillage tool that will achieve these purposes. Uh, many of these people have, have a lot of the, the right pieces of the puzzle. And it takes a certain step of faith to make it do even more. And We've had some chances building curse busters and quoting them to people to say, okay, yeah, we can, we can, we can save some money by taking those rotary harrows off the back. You know, we'll, we'll save you so much money. We'll just sell you this, right? Or somebody say, well, gee, we really like your time and system, blah, blah, blah. Can't we buy just one, one unit instead of two, you know? So there's been lots of opportunities for us to compromise what we feel is a tool that God's called us to build 
but we know and we've se we've seen this now long enough that if we if we undo one part of that if we miss it we miss a whole opportunity a whole series of opportunities to do things that really continue to rescue us from doing things which will set us back which cause us to have to do a reset so to speak and we have to recover ground over again it's like going forward two steps and backing up one our progress gets slower and slower and so one of the th we're headed right the other way and we're trying desperately to make it even more effective um, I didn't include any pictures of our latest development which is a chrome clad tine um, they're actually running in in Florida and Alabama now on that machine that you saw in the video and it will literally make the time base almost infinitely recyclable. And the only thing that will have to happen is to put a new chrome cladding around the cutting edge of the time itself. And that should increase the life expectancy, according to the people who I've watched their chrome parts run many, many years, over 30 years, could very well increase our time life by 400 to 500%. And, um, if that happens, hopefully cost and maintenance efforts and all those kinds of things will become even more attractive to people to put this whole thing together. That rotary hair on the back uh, essentially really puts the finishing touches on a system which John Kemp has actually touched on, but he's not talked about Curse Buster. One of the things John's talking about these days is the fact that the key to a very prolific and a and beneficial effective fungal system is a very prosperous bacterial system and um, with mary's help and maybe some others we may be able to determine if in fact we're actually achieving that with the action of those rotary harrows on the top and the amount of tillage they do although they don't invert they merely mix and sort of restructures, kind of like mixing batter with a, a coarse fork. Um, we think that we're actually doing some very positive things there to the bacteria portion of the soil microbiome, but we're leaving the fungal world deeper, totally intact with very, very little, if any, air quality change. And I'd be very curious to know if you have any comments about that mary or andy i see you're unmuted do you want to make a comment either of you or anybody so so i can uh, basically just yeah anything uh, what one of the things we used to look at on rangelands was the difference in a continuous track of disturbance, like a wheel track from a four-wheeler or a truck, as compared mm -hmm. to intermittent track, like hoof prints. And I saw a lot of mm -hmm. data coming from some studies where they were comparing this kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, the, the continuity is a big deal. And so when I saw your design and saw that it's leaving these discontinuous kind of aeration holes is the way I... At least that's what mm -hmm. it looks like it's happening from the videos. Uh, yep. It grabbed my attention because, again, you are, of course, you're disturbing the fungal community when you go in there and make any kind of hole. But if you've got a thick network of hyphae, it's nothing mm -hmm. to reconnect that little gap. It's, it's like doing road yep. work. You're not going to destroy the highway by, by going in there and patching up some cracks in the road. Um, right. So, so I think that's the big difference that you might mm -hmm. be creating there um, mm -hmm. is, is just being able to see you you allow a, a easier route for those fungi to reconnect and and kind of seal the gaps and continue growing. Yeah, I I thought about sharing a pic uh, an illustration just because it came to mind so strongly when you were talking about the root depth and the corn and the alfalfa going together. Um, mm -hmm. And if you'd like, I can try to put this up on the screen. But we it's had a, 
We had a gentleman years ago who literally at the USDA Pornada Experimental Range until he died. Uh, they, they buried his ashes on the range land. And uh, he, was, he was a very dedicated ecologist. And I'm sorry, I thought I had this up ready to go. Uh, but one example of the kind of study he did, if you can imagine, uh, we're located in the Chihuahuan Desert. So this is the largest desert in North America. We get uh, roughly about 13 inches of annual rainfall. Uh, what, one of the comments I made to Jim when he started talking to me about doing doing workshops with Midwest corn growers is all I could think is I've never seen soils where real crops grow that actually have organic matter in them <laughs> because we don't have a lot of organic matter in our arid soils. But um, he wanted to look at, at um, how these how these roots from different we, we were trying to understand this this horrible shrub encroachment that we've seen on these rangelands. Um, because even with what appears to be the best management practices, um, and I know you can always toss opinions around on that, but, but we went with the belief that we were using some of the best practices available to science, uh, we're still seeing massive shrub encroachment on these lands that are too too large and too arid to to use agronomic techniques for managing and basically he went through and dug these root pro profiles for several species of plants and compared shrubs and grasses and all i'm going to do is try to scroll through some of these creosote bush of course is uh is is one of the dominant shrubs in these lands but I like this image here because it shows several different kinds of uh, desert range plants. And as you look, each plant species has a completely different root profile. And so when you were talking about growing your corn and your alfalfa together, I'm thinking, well, yeah, alfalfa's got a taproot system. It's going to go down deeper. It's going to pull resources that the corn can't access. And, and it's going to store some of that water at deeper levels for the dry, dry season. Um, you know, here's some shrubs that are going down like three meters. And by the way, these roots are penetrating almost pure caliche in many cases. So we get incredibly alkaline soils. And, um, you know, it's a very, very different kind of soil than you're going to see in the Midwest. And you, you just get a complete layering of root types in the natural system. So I'll stop there, but I thought that might be worth throwing up when we talk about things like cover cropping, because I think that's what you want to create, is that whole network where every gap is filled by something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I think that uh, Dave just made a reminder to me. His one of his uh, Dave Chance's catchphrases is that he used last night was aeration without inversion. Uh, the reality of it is that sudden influxes of atmospheric N2 and O2 are just an incredible disaster. It's like turning a respirator up um, on someone who needs oxygen supplementation of breathing assistance uh, you turn up the air too high increase the oxygen concentrations and you're going to have a corpse on your hands or you're going to have someone who's seriously injured and so it is that when we do tillage it's very difficult to achieve the goals and purposes of tillage without turning the respirator up way too high there, the aspirator, what do you want to call it? Um, we got the regulator turned way up and it's, it's a disaster to soil microbial life. It needs to breathe, but it doesn't need a supercharger or a turbocharger, which so many of our tillage tools uh, provide. Um, 
one way or another though we have to address that curse we've got to we've got to deal with it because if it rains that silt is going to move and it's moving in your desert it may move half as fast because you've only got 13 inches of rain a year but it still is moving um, we've got a very good friend who's up on the Gobi Desert in northern Mongolia who actually has in his possession the, the only machine built in the version of Curse Buster in Asia. And he's attacking the Gobi Desert with a five-foot machine. But he's making his point, and he's making it very well with 15 inches of rainfall a year. He's, he's got alfalfa that is um, just absolutely amazing. Nobody's ever seen a crop like this, and it's surviving the, the terrible cold, and it's, it's thriving, it's breathing, it's taking in the water. The city of Darhan has 30-inch diversion ditches all around it in the middle of a desert. Well, why would you need a 30-foot-high diversion ditch in a desert? Well... It's easy. When it rains, it doesn't go on the ground. There's no plants there. There's no way for it to begin to infiltrate. So it runs down toward the city of Darhan. And in order to protect themselves, they need a 30-foot berm. So the Gobi Desert just basically needs to gather the water. Most deserts... The 13 inches have a huge productive capability, but we don't get the water in the ground very well. And we don't, so we don't gather it. And that's got to be about the first thing, I think, doesn't it? Somehow we've got to break that cycle without turning it upside down and turning it into a dust bowl. Aeration without inversion. And there's a water table under that desert, too. They drill the holes and they find it. And they make it flower because they pull the water up from it. If we could get it to breathe and get it to take in some water, we could begin to establish a continuous green cover. I really believe it. Andy Andrioli, any comments from you tonight? Earl, Rodney, are you using that old airway? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Uh, no, I don't have anything too much. <laughs> okay. So, no, the smart screen works pretty good. That's what I use it for. I beg your pardon? I said, no, the smart screen works pretty good for what I use it for. Uh -huh. Just, uh, Hopefully, I can start using it a little bit more. <laughs> it, uh, it'll never do what you were doing with that Salford Dister that you showed us last night. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't expect that. <laughs> no, but I'm not into yet. Just uh, more of the rolling down the rye. So um, ah. I've got a roller, and hopefully, I can incorporate it you know, a little bit with that, too. Okay. Earl, you're unmuted. Something you wanted to add? Yes. Well, I just, uh, I know I've talked to you about this before, Jim, but uh, uh, after renting uh, that Curse Buster last spring, uh, I can say for sure that machine does, it does an awful lot of different things. The adjustability you've got on that machine um, gives you the, the options to do anything from aerating a hay field or pasture clear up to making a field look like it's been dissed and i know uh it, it's got great abilities for uh incorporating small grains we we had the best uh stand of oats we've ever had this last spring after incorporating them with that curse buster but uh still running our gentile we ran it quite a bit this fall and um if I can ever find a buyer for it, I'll buy a Curse Buster. We're going to keep running it for now. Well, one of the um, one of the real encouragements is people like yourself who, who 
plunged earlier on and, and got a tool, um, it just stay faithful with it because things will get better. Um, no, and I, yeah, Jim, I just want to say uh, you're uh, uh, just the the teaching you've given me over the last couple of years into how to use that thing has been invaluable. I mean, you know, I I, I bought that thing back in 2006 and uh, it wasn't really until I got to know you about three years ago that I really started to understand the, the purpose of what that thing was for and what it could do and uh, really educating people about what it's doing underneath the soil surface is critical. Well, to a very real degree, Earl, it's, um, it's been exciting to encourage people because for the most part, people who can't see into the invisible can't see what it's doing. Um, exactly. Yep. No, absolutely. It's not to be judgmental in any way, but some folks will probably never have a vision for what this kind of technology is about. And, right. And I could talk to them for years and it probably is still never going to sink in. <laughs> you know, it's never going to make a difference. Maybe if they don't like my beard, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've held you all for an hour and 45 minutes. You've been very patient to listen to me drone on. Anything anybody else wants to add for the good of the order? It's now or never. I want to release you back to your families. <laughs> okay. Um, to me, there was one other point I wanted to make. Yes, Earl, you brought it up. It's your fault. Um, one of the things that I've called this technology over as I've watched it perform, and I've heard you people testify about what it does and your small grains with some of those things, is I tend to call it when it comes to managing soil moisture and gas exchange and water movement and so forth, I've finally come to call it the great normalizer. When we were in Florida just um, a few days ago, they'd had a significant amount of rainfall, not as much as Alabama, but significant. And some of the fields, it was wet enough. I was glad we weren't there any sooner. But in a matter of a half an hour, the top of the soil was drying out. And the guys were walking over the field and saying, this almost, it's just, this is sandy, silty soil. And it was sticking to our shoes. And now you can kick this dirt two inches deep now and it doesn't stick to your shoes. You know, it's like, where'd the water go? It, it's, it's moist, but it's not really drying out. It doesn't look like, hmm. And then they realized that actually there was excess of water and it was draining out. And so the moisture gradient became uniform, driest on the top and progressively uniformly wetter down. And then in the opposite situation where you actually want to bring up some capillary water because you need to germinate those oats in the spring, it normalizes it going the other way and it pulls moisture up into where your seeds have been placed. It's, it's something that, I had nothing to do with. I'd just been standing on the sidelines watching what happens. It was something that God Almighty gave to Peter Bannon a long time ago. And it's just been a thrill just being a steward over the deposit of faith that God put in Peter that we can be able to keep passing this along. It's unbelievable. And the result of this has been... Um, something that ties into something you had said here, Suzanne, that these soils become almost re, um, immune to compaction. We heard Bob Chenderlech uh, uh, today talking about aggregate stability. 
and how critical it is as an element to, to be evaluated in determining soil health. And it, it is because it has so much to do with the ability of the soil to transport water and exchange air. Um, the Mason family up there and those uh, really 45% clay, 45% soil soils, boy, when it rains, the neighbors are tracking mud up and down the county roads, oh, they got to get out there with the blades and clean up after the day silage harvesting. And these guys haven't made a rut in a field, and it's not because they wait until the ground freezes. It rains an inch or two, and they go back out there like it was sandy soil. And then the next day, and it's gone, and they don't they don't ever make a track. And um, so this so many elements of this dynamic uh, in soil health have manifested themselves. And one of the reasons why I brought Bob Schendel back in today, guys, is because the Cornell test, because it involves some of the mechanical aspects of soil health, which really have a profound effect on a lot of the uh, rest of the soil health development. They're about the only guys I know of that are really doing a job in that respect in terms of those kinds of tests. So um, that's that's one of those things that it tends to, you know, something builds on itself. It has this self-perpetuating element. Once you begin to build larger root masses and then you leave them intact, they don't go anywhere. They begin to establish a, a, a uh, set of associations, set of physical relationships and then you just add more to it which i suppose i got to shut up but the reality of it is that a no-till environment where you have new plant root systems that are trying to inhabit old decaying root passageways those are plants which are being placed in jeopardy we actually need a tillage strategy which is going to produce new opportunities for new root systems to root independently of old passageways. It's a whole, it's a whole lot better place to be. I, I wrote a piece one time years and years ago. I said, anybody been raising their family in a cemetery around your neighborhood? Most people put cemeteries and stay away from it. So if we've got decomposition going on, it's not really that good an idea to put a new young plant right in close proximity to that decaying old plant. It's going on and let's try to make it go on as beneficially as possible. But I don't think I want to live in the, in the cemetery if I'm a young corn plant. Um, with that, there's so many other stories and, and things that uh, we could be talking about, but you're, you're being most gracious. I'm going to release you all. Mary, do we have new links for tomorrow morning? Uh, or, I mean, uh, you have a link out now for the diversity workshop. Will we get another one for Thursday? Is that the way that's going to work now?